Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. My name is Simona Mihaita. I'm a senior lecturer at UTS. And today I am presenting uh, on behalf of my master student, Johannes, uh, the work that he has been doing as part of his internship with DOT Victoria in order to analyze the impact of off-peak fares on the train patronage um, pre and post COVID-19. Um, so without further ado, for today's presentation, I'm going to introduce you into the problem uh, and how we actually came across this um, question uh, to be answered, what objectives we had, uh, the case study uh, from Department of Transport Victoria, how we did a data mining and the patronage prediction modeling. Um, now, when it comes to disruptions, um, there are several types. The regular ones are the regular small disruptions that can happen, um, a small accident, a few minutes, or um, a door that maybe can be um, non-functioning for five, 10 minutes. However, um, what it happens is that sometimes public transport faces large travel disruptions, especially during the peak hours. So when there is a huge demand um, and um, many people using the public transport services, then, then definitely there's a lot of delays uh, that occur. Uh, around the world, governments have thought for, um, they have really looked for various solutions to these problems and all sorts of on-peak, off-peak policies, all sorts of pricing strategies um, in order to manage commuter um, volumes more effectively. However, uh, this problem is quite hard to manage. It's highly dependent on the social context of the travelers as well. Um, and pricing strategies do not work all the time. So there is a lot of debate whether or not um, this this can work and under what circumstances. Now, when you're even trying to predict under such a large disruptions, how many people would use the services if you offer a specific incentive, then the problem becomes even more harder. Um, you might train multiple machine learning models um, in order to understand uh, how the demand will fluctuate. Um, and a few of those works that have been doing so is actually um, a work uh, from Thailand um, that looked at predicting the underground train passengers or um, in Seoul. Uh, there's also um, uh, researchers using the smart card data in order to predict how many people would use the subway or not. Um, and several others that have used the same tap on tap of smart card data um, in order to train various models such as the FGBOS models and be able to predict. Now, our research objectives, because this was just um, a three months kind of internship, um, we tried to actually have a look on how um, COVID-19 had impacted the travel um, patronage across the line, uh, especially that they noticed a huge decrease, but they were not really aware of how much that would, would, would be. So the first objective we had was to analyze the impact of off-peak fares on people movement. There were some incentives uh, that have been provided um, and they wanted to know whether those worked really or not and trying to understand and look for what factors could influence those decisions. Eventually, we also wanted to see whether we could use that data to build a machine learning framework to train and um, um, or predict the patronage um, in the future. So the case study was really the V-Line network. Uh, as you can see here, this is a snapshot. It has 276 stations in total, 17 train lines. They're spreading across 79 LGAs and they're servicing almost 6.68 million people. Now, the peak hours in Victoria are considered between 7 and 9 a.m. or between 4 and 6 p.m. Uh, and during the pandemic, as I mentioned, there were specific um, off-peak discounts. One of them was if you actually arrive, uh, leave or arrive in Melbourne between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., so during the day, or after 6 p.m. in the evening, or of course weekends and public transport holidays, then you would actually get a 30% discount on your fare. Um, the data that we have been received um, before the COVID pandemic and after it was actually uh, scattered across uh, 2019, 
the month of February, March, August, November. And um, actually, I want to mention that uh, the last week of November 2021 was the week when um, there was a significant ease of the lockdown. Now, when we started doing the monthly and daily analysis, as you can see from this chart in the first one, um, this is February 2019 and this is March um, uh, 2019 versus 2021. Uh, the yellow curve is 2019, the blue one is 2021. Uh, there's definitely a significant decrease uh, that has um, occurred um, and this reached even 57-60% uh, during those first uh, months of each year. Now, when you look further down the year, so for example, this is August 2019, there was a significant um, drop, 87.5%. Um, and basically you could see that um, in the stri very strict uh, uh, traveling uh, restrictions that have been put in place in Victoria in August um, were felt significantly on the patronage um, across public transport. Um, in November, uh, the travel started to pick up. Um, basically, this was a significant ease of the restrictions. So definitely, there was still um, a slowdown from the pandemic. However, the demand started to pick up again. Uh, what's happening, in, as we can see here, with the blue curve? The blue curve um, still follows the two morning and afternoon peaks. Um, during all conditions, right, during the pandemic. So this means that people still travel during those first hours in the morning and um, in the afternoon, um, despite giving uh, being given that 30% discount um, during the lockdown. So this to us showed us that the 30% discount were really not that motivating for people and they would still travel according to their work um, uh, commuting trips that they had to do. We further break down on our by our 24 hour kind of profiling. So this is a daily peak um, versus off peak impact analysis. Uh, and as you can see here, we have all the data from Monday to Sunday being plotted. Um, this was actually uh, on February 2019 versus February 2021. So definitely, if we're looking at the peak hours, 7 and 8 a.m., let's say, um, there's a significant uh, demand increase um, uh, prior to the COVID, which actually was kept as well uh, during COVID. So this first two hours of the morning, 7 and 8 a.m., they still remain as the top preferred hours for people to uh, to travel in the morning, um, most likely to work. Um, there's definitely uh, for 8 a.m. a uh, decrease from 40 plus thousand travelers to 16,000 plus travelers. So a huge 63 percent reduction in the travel demand. However, if you have a look at um, 6, um, 6 a.m. as well, there is definitely um, a significant reduction from 10,000 down to 4,000. So um, also, I wanted to mention that in 2021, um, the off-peak travel, so it, it represented 75% of all travel. And then basically in 2019, uh, in, um, uh, 20, uh, 19, it was 77. So 77 here and um, 75 here. What it means that um, we uh, we should have seen basically an increase in the off-peak travel um, during the pandemic because of the fair kind of like incentives. However, that didn't happen. The only exception that we noticed was actually Saturdays. Saturdays between uh, 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., there is definitely an increase um, of patronage uh, during the pandemic. Most likely, people trying to relax, um, go out for um, leisure during the weekends and have some, some free times um, uh, outside of the restricted um, areas. So overall, when we look at the yearly analysis of patronage decrease across all the, all the lines, so um, that was, I forgot to mention, this was the Beckenham line, but the same travel behavior happened across all the line. So definitely all the lines have suffered um, in August an 
uh, 0.4 decrease in patronage in November as well, 58. I think the easiest one was March uh, when only 43% of the patronage um, has been affected. Um, now, knowing that we wanted to see whether this data is suitable um, to be able to predict under such disruptions uh, in the future, the number of people that will still need to take public transport, because this is extremely important. Um, we're talking about those critical passengers that still need to go to work even when a pandemic hits. So we use this data, uh, we actually filtered it, uh, we started building the metrics of features where we um, use each day of the week, hour of the day, and then the tap on, tap offs that we had here. Um, I want to mention that this metrics of features could have been even larger by including weather, by including other types of special events. However, just for this particular piece of exercise, we kept it pretty simple um, and we we just wanted to see whether it's working or not. We then basically went and did various validation and test methods. So um, trying the holdout validation with 60% of training, 20% of the data used for validation and 20 for testing. Um, there was also a five-fold cross-validation, the 10-fold cross-validation that have been tested and trying to see which one of these would um, be best suited for the models that we had. And then basically there were several um, uh, machine learning models that have been tested, such as linear regression, support vector machines, um, uh, the SVM kernels, the boosted trees, the neural networks, and the regression trees. All the results have been analyzed using RMSE and R squared in order to see what model would act the best or not. When we actually looked at comparing the results by the validation method, so we looked at the RMSC results versus the R square results, um, and uh, these are the three validation methods, and um, they are um, evaluated against the most um, well performing models, which were the boosted trees, the medium neural networks, and the wide neural networks. And what we actually noticed is that the lowest RMSE results were obtained for, for the five-fold cross-validation methods and the highest um, R-square as well were obtained for, for the same validation method. So definitely we use the five-folds uh, cross-validation. However, um, there's definitely, um, how should I say, a very close performance behavior with the other validation methods as well. It's all about fine tuning the size of the uh, the K fold so that you can actually get the best um, um, performance out of your model. However, I do want to mention that unfortunately, such a small data set can suffer from uncertainty. There are um, authors that have shown this. So we realized this behavior is happening as well in, into our model training. Um, when we compared across all models um, against the same two measures, RMSE and R squared, um, there are a few things notice, that we noticed. The first one is that the best performing model was the boosted trees in both um, RMSE and um, R squared. The worst one was the SVM kernel. Um, however, as you can see, also these results, these errors are pretty large, and we would have further uh, improved, fine-tuned the models um, with more data set um, if this would have been available. So what's happening when you have such a small data is basically you're trying only on a restricted number of uh, entry points, and the models, despite being very clever at doing that, um, they still need a lot more information in order to be able to extract daily patterns and to extract like special conditions uh, for such large events. So one of the recommendations we actually provided to DOT Victoria was to fine tune those models and inject more data into them just to see how they're working. Um, however, this was, this was not possible due to privacy restrictions um, that we had um, uh, last year when we did the, 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 the modeling. Uh, however, this can be easily done uh, when such data becomes available. In regards to conclusions, um, for us, this was really an initial data explorations, whether to understand how the um, off-peak 
um, fares have impacted uh, the um, the patronage and the travel across the network. And for us, definitely, um, the, the, the analysis revealed an inefficiency of the off-peak travel kind of incentives. They were not working. Um, and one of the questions we had were why. So we actually explored the literature for various factors. And it turned out there are other researchers that have been investigating um, the factors that could affect the travel during the pandemic. So, for example, in 2021, researchers from ITLS uh, actually surveyed a, a lot of people from Australia, and they actually showed there is a huge correlation between the hygiene concerns and the patronage numbers. So people refused to take um, public transport under um, such pandemic conditions. Definitely. Um, the high-risk areas for COVID represented a risk for many people. They refused to work. Other studies have shown that when you have strict travel conditions, then people redefine their, their, their travels and their daily activities. And basically, they, they change uh, also um, the days that they're working from home. Now, uh, what we actually tend to notice from this small data set is that the departure time is extremely important when it comes to patronage numbers. And regardless of incentives or not, um, departing very early in the morning, um, especially for people that have specific um, working hours, nine to five, it's very, very hard. So the departure time is probably the most critical factor that we observed um, that influences the performance of such models. Um, the price reduction, of course, definitely the 30% price reduction is not efficient enough. We would have um, uh, recommended uh, at least trying several pricing techniques, such as maybe 50% um, reduction or even free travel during the uh, peak hours, just to to uh, just to see uh, uh, during the um, off peak hours, just to see whether people will still um use more the public transport outside of those hot uh hot times um definitely the health concerns are the ones that um stopped people from using it and of course the nature of work um we believe that um for people that still have to commute uh to work using public transport this still needs to happen so those percentages of of numbers that were still maintaining there or from people that definitely needed to to travel no matter what. Um, that's all for today's presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me as a, uh, this email address. And of course, I'm looking for feedback in the future uh, to know of similar studies or what we could have done better. Thank you.